good morning to you, Stuart. It's so nice to have you joining us uh, for this conversation. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us because we know you're very busy. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind, if you would just give us a, a short self-introduction uh, so that our audience has a better idea of who we are talking to. Yeah, well, it's good to see you again, Phil. Uh, so I, I'm Stuart McPherson. Uh, I'm the new master of wood for, for Nine Rivers Distillery. T to give you a little bit of background to myself, I've been in uh, the Scotch whiskey industry for 43 years. And uh, last June, uh, I decided that I was going to take early retirement and, uh, you know, explore other opportunities within the, within the spirits world. You know, I started off uh, my career in, in 1979 as an apprentice cooper. And, and through that journey, uh, I became a time-served cooper, uh, repairing and making barrels. And we'll maybe talk about that in a little bit more detail uh, later on. Uh, and then I went on to manage the cooperages uh, for, for Edrington, who <clears throat> were the parent company for Macallan uh, Scotch Single Malt. And, uh, and then laterally, uh, in 2012, I became the master of wood for Macallan, and that really involved uh, looking at the quality of casks that uh, Macallan was purchasing or having made, actually, to our specifications, uh, looking at that whole control and quality process. And then, you know, laterally, around about 2016, I was involved in setting up an audit team in southern Spain to work with our cast manufacturers and seasoning bodegas uh, to ensure that one, the casks were manufactured to our specifications, and secondly, that they were seasoned with the correct wines uh, during that, that period as well. Yeah, and you know we're very happy to benefit from from this wisdom, because I imagine after so many years of working with these kinds of materials, that a lot of it is trial and error, and then you just kind of gradually figure out what is the best method to use. It, you know, definitely. I mean, I think uh, through through a number of you know legislations and changes, you know, oak. Uh, in terms of the species of wood, has has always uh, been the preferred uh, type of timber, and obviously through you know legislations in the Scotch Whisky Association, there is certain uh, how can I put it? Yeah, there's certain guidelines uh, that that we need to stick to to actually be able to call it uh, Scotch Scotch whisky. One of those is actually to uh, to be able to use oak. Now, uh, I think you know part part of that then is that you know, what does that impact on 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 spirit and the quality and everything else that goes along with it. with a let, let's talk about your career as a cooper uh first of all can you very quickly define what a cooper is well basically uh you know a cooper is a person who will will either you know make casks from from wood or or repair existing casks that have been manufactured from or constructed uh, f from wood. Generally, what you find in Scotland is that uh, for for most of the vast majority of, of casks that we receive into the industry, is that they require to be repaired. So that that's a case of uh, examining the cask for any defects that might cause it to leak when it's refilled. And as part of its manuf uh, part of its uh, maturation process, you you really maybe have to look at you know countries like uh, America, France, uh, Spain, who are manufacturing casks from scratch to uh, 
to hold a specific liquid. So, for example, in America, it could be bourbon, it could be wines, uh, and the same in Europe as well. However, in Scotland, you, you're generally taking a cask that has been what we call seasoned with a, with a previous liquid and then filling that with a uh, new make spirit. So that Cooper's involvement uh, in Scotland is about uh, repairing and maintaining the casks, uh, and maybe in these other countries that I mentioned, is about the manufacturing uh, of, of casks from basically cut timber, green timber that's then dried, shaped, either toasted in the inside, or, or charred in the inside, uh, depending on what the requirements are. Yeah, I had, I had imagined that making the barrels was part of that, but I had not considered the re the repairing of the barrel to also be a part of the Cooper's work. And I imagine that is substantially more difficult considering that you're starting with uh, something that somebody else has already uh, created. And so it may be more difficult to get that correct if you're repairing the barrel. Well, what, what you what you would be assessing for, so, you know, if you started off in, in your career as an apprentice, for example, you, you would firstly learn how to handle the casks, how to move them about, you know, safely. Uh, and and then you go on to the next stage of of actually being able to examine them and identify potential defects whether that's in the actual staves or, or the body of the cask or maybe the ends or the heads, as some people call them. So, you know, once you've identified that there's maybe a crack or a defect, what you generally do is you would probably cannibalize uh, another cask, which is of a similar shape and dimension, and then use that to repair uh, similar casks. So, for example, if you were uh, repairing a bourbon barrel, for example, then there's quite a lot of uniformity in that initial construction process. So when you go then to repair a cask in Scotland, you know, many years later, you would actually find a suitable replacement cask that you can use for, well, let's just say it's like cars, a spare parts, uh, so... Okay, uh, this is, I imagine, to be pretty advanced coopering techniques. Uh, let's back up a moment and talk about how does one actually become a cooper? Like, how many how many years does it take to enter into this profession and become your own uh, your own cooper person? It, it's it's a four year apprenticeship now, uh, and there's there's different ways. Some companies maybe have. Uh, what they call a school, so there'll be like a master cooper or a, a time-served tradesman who's then teaching these young students uh, that that process of, of repairing or making. Uh, then uh, you have an opportunity to uh, repair casks uh, yourself uh, or within within the, the company. And generally what we call is, is is paid by results. So this PBR system where uh, you're accountable for your own casks, you're accountable for the quality and and the standards and, and you're paid uh, individually on each cask you produce. So each cask could have a value. And then as you produce more of them in a day, that would account to to your salary either at the end of the week or at the month at the end of the month. Hmm. All right. Uh, so then, let's imagine that you are starting out as a as as a student cooper. It's your first day of class. Uh, what is the first thing that you're going to learn as a apprentice cooper? Well, I, I think. <laughs> You, you you would initially uh, probably read some, you know, you would be introduced to maybe a, a, a buddy or a partner who can, can show you uh, the actual safe methods of of handling a cask, whether that's whether that's rolling it, uh, just just being comfortable with handling because 
you know, some of these are, you know, extremely heavy and and, and awkward shaped uh, tasks or, or vessels to, to use. Mm -hmm. So initially, Phil, it's all about that, the, the health and safety side of it and the and the kind of manual the the manual handling of casks mm -hmm. okay uh so i it, it's got to be a whole lot of reading and preparing uh because i hadn't imagined like also but you're you're absolutely right these barrels are pretty big and understanding safety is probably of uh, paramount importance for new coopers because you, you can't get injured you know you know definitely i mean we've got obviously you were you mentioned earlier about you know technology obviously you know technology has has evolved as as the industry uh i suppose has became more uh more modernized more mechanized so uh, you know probably we look to you know machinery that's implemented to uh make it easier in terms of the manual handling so taking some of that physical element out of it uh, and that can be machines that are you know barrel rotating for for the testing process or you maybe have machinery which is you know driving down the hoop iron or the cast uh, sorry driving down the hoops to make the cask tighter you know, many years ago, that was all physically done by hand, and it was quite time consuming. You, you know, even jointing uh, staves and and shaping them, a lot of that was done by hand rather than you know automated you know jointers and circular saws. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they've been they've been they've been a they've been, been, been a a great benefit, obviously, to to the cooper. But, but obviously to, to companies as well, because then you could increase the production. So uh, the efficiencies were, were much better. Mm -hmm. Right. So then with the use of technology and, uh, you know, the art of uh, cooperage isn't quite as, um, as archaic as some people may think. Uh, so it, it feels like it's been streamlined and modernized pretty well. Well, there's, there's there's a couple of you know different processes. Some there there is some cooperages, uh, not many uh, in Scotland. I mean, let let's just kind of put this into context. I mean, probably now in in the Scotch whisky industry, there might be between two hundred and fifty and three hundred coopers physically working on the tools. Uh, you know, repairing casks or or making casks. If in the mid seventies there was probably one and a half thousand, it was quite a demise in in the industry. Uh, it, it probably in the early eighties, uh, where a lot of distilleries had closed down, and there wasn't that necessity or requirement for casks. So you know, over the last I would say twenty years, uh, twenty five years. The industry uh, and the craft of coopering has began to increase its numbers, which is which is great. Uh, so, you know, you know, typically now what a cooper would happen is that casks would be they would be emptied or disgorged at a distillery, for example, and they'll either be examined at that particular location. If casks are ready to be refilled and there's no defects, then that's fine. If not, the casks would be returned to a cooperage. Now, not every distillery has a cooperage, so they might be using some independent companies to repair casks for them. So that would generally involve, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, coopers bringing in the cask to their workstation and and physically examining it for any defects, cracks and staves, uh, maybe some knots or defects in the wood that would potentially, you know, make it leak. So, so once they've they've identified the problems, they then what we call open up the cask. So they remove 
the majority of the hoops, the they take out the damaged staves or ends and then replace them uh, with new pieces of tim uh, timber uh, or use that they've been able to source from, from other casks. And then it's a case of ensuring that that cask is tight. Uh, now, there's no nails or there's no, there's no glue that actually holds the cask together. It's 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 the the shape and the skill of the the craftsman, uh, the tightening and pressure of the hoops, uh, that allow once the cask has been tested with air and water, to ensure that it's tight for filling with liquid again. Yeah, I, I can't imagine constructing something like a, a vessel without using nails or 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 glue, right? Uh, but you know, for obvious reasons, you don't want that affecting the whiskey or the the liquid inside. So it makes perfect sense. Correct, correct. And you know, you never know, Phil. You know, once I have an opportunity to come over to China, uh, we we can maybe have some of these these classes where we can show people and demonstrate what's what's involved in the art of coopering. You can yeah, maybe I, even have a chance yourself. I would absolutely be willing to take that chance. I think it would be a lot of fun to get some hands on learning to see like how the how how the how important and how difficult the cask is um correct yeah. i mean you talk about in importance of the cask and there's been there's been kind of many comments over the years but if if you for example have a cask that's uh relatively new uh and it's never had New make spirit. It's probably a little bit more technical. You know, this this part of it is that uh, a cask can be accountable for, you know, maybe between fifty and seventy percent of that final flavor uh, and color. Because if you can imagine a cask, uh, it's a bit like a tea bag. The more you fill and empty it the less extractives you can take from the wood. So that, that new make spirit uh, has less of an opportunity if that cask has been filled numerous times before to actually have an ex a, a significant impact on that maturing liquid. That's why I say that, you know, the casks, the wood quality, the toasting temperatures, are are probably well, not probably they are the biggest single influences in the development of spirit. Yes, there is other uh, there's other factors, but the actual quality and wood species, along with toasting temperatures, are are the main drivers. Mm -hmm. Okay, that that that's a very detailed response. I really appreciate you going into depth there. So we've talked about uh, a lot so far. Uh, we've talked about uh, what a cooper does, what a cooper learns, and the uh, the construction of the barrels, uh, how the barrels and the casks influence the, the whiskey's flavor. And so my next question is, you you described yourself as a, a master of wood. And I, I certainly hope I don't speak for myself when I, when I say I don't really know all what that entails. Can you walk us through a little bit about how you become a master of wood and what a master of wood, uh, how, what does that title actually mean? How does, how does one become a master of wood? Well, I, you know, I probably have, uh, you know, in my previous role, I probably have my, my friends in, in the marketing world that, you know, is, you know, gave me this esteemed title. Uh, I think, you know, firstly, there was, you know, no other titles within the Scotch whiskey industry that somebody was the master of wood. Uh, because uh, McAllen had such a, a, an impact and an influence in that, that, and that story uh, and benefit behind the development and the quality of liquid was very much driven by our attention to detail in, in the cast manufacturing was that there was there was a there was an opportunity to be able to uh and through all that experience that I you know I've gained as I as I as I mentioned earlier 
what was to was to be able to share that with consumers, with media, with journalists, just about how important wood is in that process. Uh, so you know, I, I didn't go to university and and study a degree and uh, you know and and in forestry or, or anything like that. But I think, like everything, you you pick up a, that 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 knowledge and experience over many, many years, you know, identifying timber that could potentially cause an issue uh, as either part of that drying out process or manufacturing process that would then have uh, an impact negatively or positively on on spirit. And, and then also looking at the cask construction side of it as well, Phil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, that, that makes sense to me. Um, if we were going to uh, compare Master of Wood to something else, uh, is there a, an equitable title that you think uh, Master of Wood could also be called? Well, I think now within within the spirits industry, you have like master blenders or master whiskey makers. And, and you know, these are people, in, in my opinion, uh, who have had you know, a long and established uh, career with, within within their, their designated field uh, of, of, of knowledge and expertise. You know, out, out with that, um, you know, apart from people having master degrees in, in, in whatever they're studying, uh, from, from a spirits industry, these would be the kind of similarities. But because... A lot of distillers companies don't actually have cooperages attached to them. They're very much dependent on uh, in, independent cooperages uh, for that quality. And that was one of the focuses uh, which really for McAllen, you know, we we had our we had our own cooperages. We we knew the the standard and the quality that we you know we wanted to to achieve, and being able to can monitor that and control it obviously gave us a better uh, a better understanding uh, and a better insight into into the quality of casks and the development of spirit. When you start to, to when you start to rely on other cooperages, then you know. There's maybe not that same knowledge between, yes, manufacturing a cask, but, but then how does that cask that you've repaired or manufacture, how does how has that performed from a spirit development with uh with your with your clients? And that's something that's probably not shared. But uh there is few. I mean, obviously, people like Diageo, William Grants, Edrington, they have cooperages who, who are attached, are part of that, uh, are part of that business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. It sounds like you had a really busy time. And, you know, over, after 43 years of working and then a, a well-deserved retirement, I, I can't help but wonder why on earth are you still deciding to work, right? You could be on a beach somewhere. You could enjoy that beach in Spain. Uh, so what keeps you going? Why are you still, why are you still going at it with whiskey? Well, well, firstly, if, if you, you know, if you know anything about the weather in Scotland, maybe lying in a beach at this time of year, maybe isn't a, isn't, isn't a bad idea, but you know, Phil, there was there was part of it that you know I've been extremely fortunate in in my forty three years. Uh, I've had the chance to obviously you know learn and work on uh, an exceptional craft, being able to you know meet and engage with consumers who who enjoy whiskey and uh, yeah and not just particularly the brands that we had, and and I think. For me, it was it was giving something back. Uh, I think there's always an opportunity to learn more. And I think while while people enjoy spirits, it's about explaining part of that process that would and and specific processes in the manufacturing of casks 
has on the development of spirit. So, you know, I wanted to share uh, share some of the the knowledge and experience that I had. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why I decided to uh, do some consultancy with clients. And and unfortunate, unfortunately, you know, I now have the opportunity to work with Nine Rivers in what is, you know, an amazing project uh, that I think will be able to expand that that knowledge and experience to to the the consumers that we hope to reach out to.